good afternoon everybody i think we can um, kick off now and i know uh quite a few more people will be joining us as we um um but i think we in the interest of time let's let's get started now my name is anna gondak chan i'm the global programs coordinator with calc and uh, I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, for the next hour, we will be uh, hearing from three professionals with significant expertise in uh, translating responsible data policies at the organizational level into the daily practice across organizations. Um, this webinar will be recorded um, so if uh, you are, uh, if you'd like to share it with your networks and colleagues um, later on, we'll be posting it um, probably tomorrow or the day after. Let me start by uh, introducing our experts. Um, we are grateful to have today um, uh, Rick Tal. Uh, Global Advisor ICT in Program from Oxfam, uh, one of our members. Uh, we uh, also have your parents, uh, who is the Data Policy Officer at the Center for Humanitarian Data with United Nations uh, Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance. We, and we also have uh, Linda Raftree, who is an independent consultant uh, specializing in ethical uses of technology and digital data. She is also an organizer of Merle Tech Conference. And she will be joining us a little bit later into the call, as I know she has another uh, commitment just before. Okay, um, before I hand over to uh, the speakers, uh, I just wanted to um, say a few words about how the idea of the webinar came about. Um, some of you will no doubt be aware that very often when CBA assistance is mentioned, um, cash and voucher assistance that is, uh, this immediately triggers the conversation about associated risks, um, be it protection, access, anti-money laundering, and uh, most recently also risks related to how data life cycle is managed. CALP, uh, together with World Food Program, co-leads a separate work stream under the brand bargain process for cash and risk. And this year in particular, and very much in response to demand from um, our members, CALP is um, doing a lot of work to raise awareness and advance the debate among CVA practitioners around responsible data management. We're bringing in thinking from other sectors and expertise beyond cash and voucher assistance. Um, we're very grateful for some of the contributions from um, today's speakers um, and um, our collaboration with um, OCHA HDX colleagues. Uh, we held a workshop uh, with ADX, HDX and ICRC back in April and uh, on data responsibility. And it was clear that um, being more responsible with data lifecycle management from collection through to uh, data afterlife um, can feel really overwhelming for practitioners uh, because most um, organizations have tight budgets, limited capacity and also outdated systems. Um, CALP members often tell us that a particular challenge they encounter is how to translate the policies that are developed and adopted at HQ levels into um, everyday practice. A simple reliance on trickle-down effect is a gamble that doesn't always pay off. So in today's discussion, which complements our uh, blog series and also runs parallel to um, a number of regional and global events um, in uh, MENA, um, Mid Middle East um, region and uh, West Africa. Um, this, this webinar is designed to showcase experiences from uh, within and outside the network and offer some practical advice to our members in how responsible data policies may be translated into practice what initiatives are underway in some of our member organizations and uh, how can organizations self-diagnose where they are in their responsible data journey? And hopefully a bit more. Um, 
Our panelists will be happy to respond to questions, uh, but do please uh, feel free to use the chat box uh, to post your questions there. If you like to post an anonymous question, you can direct it at uh, either myself or Pauline Perez. Perez. And uh, without further ado, let me hand over to um, Rick, who is our first presenter. Over to you, Rick. Cool. cool. Thank, Thank you, you very much, much Anna. Anna. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, it's it's nice to kind of be part of this discussion. Um, so I'm just going to cover from the Oxfam side um, relatively briefly, just some of the pieces we've been working on around it says putting our responsible data policy kind of into practice over the last few years um, and there are a few key elements to that obviously the first piece is having a policy in the first place is kind of helpful and then around that we've been doing some direct trainings with um, program teams we've got a piece around data management so with a, a project our data hub project where we're trying to help teams on their reporting um, but removing identifiable data and um, sensitive data. We've also, over the last year as an organization, there's been a growth of a data rights team, um, which I'll, I'll touch on each of these pieces uh, a little bit more as we go through. Um, and then not just because of this audience, but it is worth kind of mentioning the aspect of a lot of this growth in this area and the drive has been coming because of the increasing amounts of cash and voucher programming that we've been seeing um, and the increased use of technologies for this um, and the uh, around you know, your customer the increasing um, reliance on data that we need to be very careful with um, if we can hop to the next slide please Anna hopefully um, so I just thought before kind of going too much into specific interventions, it might be useful just to give a brief overview of how long some of these initiatives have been going on within Oxfam. So back in 2015, so in August, was when we actually published our original responsible data policy. It had been signed off um, actually in April takes a while to go through sign off processes um, and this was signed off not just for Oxfam GB but the whole Oxfam Confederation so all executive directors for Oxfam signed this off um, but a key piece of this what it was a set of guidelines set of principles but without necessarily a very strong compliance framework around it um, and we kind of had to wait until May last year with the arrival of the lovely GDPR to really start actually bringing some very serious compliance around this and the arrival of GDPR brought a huge amount of weight and senior management backing to something that kind of I guess various teams have been trying to push maybe on a slightly smaller agenda up until that point so for us there it was a headache for lots of people GDPR had some big big plus points in kind of gaining traction within the organization um, but I guess the, the big step for us prior to that was the creation of our responsible data training pack. Um, and this was internally developed between our ICT and programs team and our protection team in the humanitarian department to help uh, those working on our programs to get a better understanding of what it means to be responsible with data and why we need to be responsible um, and helping people understand and recognize the power of data you know, who is asking for it and from whom who's storing it who's managing it and accessing it and really trying to get a more um, kind of a, a balanced view for a wider audience on these kind of pieces and kind of along with the publishing of the training pack we worked with the engine room to publish some research around responsible data and then subsequently with the engine room again um, early last year to do a particular piece around biometrics so this was an area that obviously for us was very closely linked in with responsible data um, 
and for us this was a piece around trying to better understand how to do biometric programming um, and not just to kind of leap in and start doing it and we did get backing internally to sort of take a bit of a step back and really try and understand the processes, the restrictions, the policies that need to be in place for that kind of work. So we've had that balance of policy coming in, trying to develop some trainings, recognizing we need to internalize this, and then having the research agenda sitting alongside to try and provide some evidence for us and our teams on, on where to go. Um, and again, throughout this whole timeline, that cash and voucher programming has just been growing and the use of technologies has been growing and it's just, again, it's helped give some weight internally to this piece. Okay, um, hop on to the next slide, just for anyone who hasn't seen it before. Um, this is our responsible uh, data management pack. So it's a great tool. We've been using it to push these ideas um, around our programs. It's based on getting people to think through the full data life cycle. Um, and it includes various handy guides for people to take away, as well as plenty of discussion sessions. So a training on this ranges between a couple of hours to maybe a day, day and a half, depending on how big the audience is, if we're training partner organizations as well, um, and, and in part how much time people have to devote to this. Um, there's lots of scenario prompts for people to think, you know, what would they do in a particular situation? And then statements, kind of get asking people to agree or disagree with certain things just to generate discussion. This isn't an area necessarily in the training pack with right and wrong answers. It's about that discussion and getting people to think through some of these problems in their day-to-day -day work. And the life cycle is a very easy process to follow because it follows much of our kind of project and program cycle management. So we were trying to ground it in the thought processes people already have within the organization. Um, if I hop to the next slide, just to give a kind of an indication of, so as, as a team, so we're a sort of small team of six or seven people at various times. Um, these are the countries we have delivered trainings in, um, and there are other trainings which have been run by, say, our protection team, um, or those working on our IS data security side, but we're trying to get quite a broad span and wherever we deliver a training, we leave a physical pack behind. So we have these in different languages. And even with all this digital discussion and the digital world, a physical training pack actually is quite a powerful uh, a thing in this process. So having something people can get hold of, they can read, they can look at, there are checklists in there, has been really useful for us in each of these countries. And we build this training into kind of any time we, we are in a country, training on either a particular tool, we're helping with project design or evaluations, we make sure a training is run. So we just build it into our timetable on any visit, which just helps kind of build those practices. Um, it's going to move on to the final slide now. I'm trying to get through this and then hopefully we can have some debate and discussion uh, at the end of the session. Um, but really looking at kind of our ongoing initiatives. So we're still doing the trainings. We still have the training pack. Um, one of the key areas that we're working on at the minute is helping countries make use of all the data they gather. Um, and one of the ways for doing this is our data hub piece. So helping countries set up databases and repositories for their own data. But the whole design and development has privacy as a core component. So we remove identifiable data, we remove sensitive data um, as it comes in from our source systems. Um, at the minute, we've just been dealing with survey data, um, but we're soon adding some of our cash and voucher systems as sources, and that'll be sort of greatly grow the amount of data coming in and the number of people who are staring at this data. Um, we also 
I mentioned we have a data rights team. So going from over the last year, we've gone from a kind of single data protection officer to a sort of small but growing team who um, are based within IS. So very more on the kind of compliance side slightly, um, but it's starting to help countries with things like privacy impact assessments and establishing champions for this in, in each country. Um, so this starts to become focal points and it starts to hopefully become a bit more self-sustaining and they are building up suites of materials um, available sort of online around each of these sections kind of on the bottom right of the screen so helping people make plans manage their data um, thinking right through to you know how to dispose of data at the end of a, a project so um, and then we are also hopefully soon uh, going to be working on a version two of our responsible data pack since it's been a couple of years since we started out on this um, and I say all the while we're keeping those discussions going and every time we talk with programs it's trying to I guess sometimes for us as a team get it's not just about legal and compliance it's the moral and ethical angles on this so it is that the power dynamics um, and and just considering whose data we're holding uh, why we're holding it um, and who else is going to be accessing it and I shall stop at that. Thank you Rick. Uh, clearly a, uh, you know, this, this is a long haul flight this uh, uh, translation of policy into practice so thank you for sharing. Um, and it's very interesting that uh, you know the physicality of this training pack is something that you've observed as uh, being quite valuable. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that, uh, if I'm not wrong, this is available for download and uh, it's very much designed as a, um, you know, anyone can pick it up and run with it. And uh, we've had some great feedback from members, in fact, who have attempted to run this uh, session. So, um, great resource there. Um, we are, I'm sure there'll be questions towards the end for you, uh, but now I'm going to move us swiftly on to um, Jos. Um, Jos, over to you. Hi, Anna, thank you. And um, thank you to Rick for um, that presentation. It's always very interesting to see the, the work that Oxfam is doing in this space. And I will echo Anna's words and say that this is a long haul flight um, with a lot of tur turbulence, I can say. It's, it's not an easy space to, to navigate. Um, so my name is Jos Behrens. I'm with the data policy team within our Center for Humanitarian Data at OCHA. Um, we were launched in December of 2017 with the aim of increasing the use and impact of data in humanitarian response. We do that along four work streams. The first is around data services, and that includes the management of the Humanitarian Data Exchange, or HDX. And we have a work stream on data literacy in which we um, provide trainings for um, OCHA staff and the wider system. Then we are just setting up a work stream around predictive analytics. And then finally, there's the data policy work stream, which uh, I sit on together with my colleague, Stuart Campo. Um, I'll be talking today a bit about the um, uh, recent workshop that we facilitated for CALP in uh, Geneva in April and some of the outcomes. And I'll switch over to the work that we're doing internally within OCHA to improve our data responsibility. So if we could move to the next slide, please. And let me also caveat everything I'm about to say by saying that I'm by no means a cash expert and my expertise is much more around data responsibility and data policy. So if you have any uh, cash specific questions regarding the work of OCHA, I'll be happy to refer you to our uh, colleagues working on, on cash. Um, so just coming to the CALP workshop in Geneva that um, Anna mentioned in her, in her introduction, um, we brought together about 30 practitioners to discuss the issues that they're facing around the management of data in cash and voucher assistance. 
Um, and we did that along three scenarios that we had uh, created in which uh, a cash and uh, voucher assistance programs rolled out in different contexts. And then we looked at the ways that data flow through those um, uh, exercises, those data management exercises, and where potential risks and challenges emerged, and then what some of the solutions could be in those, uh, in those spaces. And the outcomes from that workshop were, first of all, that it became clear that cash and, and voucher assistance really requires the management of uh, quite a bit of data including sensitive and sometimes personal data. And I was happy to hear Rick just talking about the difference between the two, um, because often these discussions around data responsibility tend to focus on personal data and unique identifiers, such as names and registration numbers or bi biometric data. Um, and a lot of the work that we do within the Center for Humanitarian Data focuses on not necessarily personal, but still potentially sensitive data. And so that can include data on um, groups that are particularly vulnerable. Um, it can uh, include data on locations uh, that might uh, be prone to targeting. So uh, there is a whole range of sensitive data that's not personal, and it's really something that uh, we focus on here at the center. Um, then the second outcome is that there are many unknowns regarding the appropriate management of this data. So there's uh, very few standards and um, widely recognized best practices on how we should be handling data in cash and voucher assistance. Third outcome is that um, there are no or hardly any concrete case studies that we can look at to see how the management of data could lead to risk or harm or to see what best practices are that we could follow uh, as a sector. And I'll be touching on this work around case studies in a, a little bit at the end of my presentation because we're uh, starting some work on developing such case studies for data responsibility together with the World Economic Forum. Final outcome of the workshop, uh, to me at least, was that we really need collaboration to tackle these issues of data responsibility. No organization can uh, handle these issues on their own. The management of data is inherently something that stretches beyond our own organizations. And so we need to work together to prevent risk and harm resulting from the management of data. So if you can move to the next slide, I'll say a bit about uh, how within OCHA, we're working on uh, data responsibility. So within the data policy team at the center, our primary output has been a working draft uh, set of data responsibility guidelines, which are internal to OCHA. They're publicly available, uh, but they're primarily tailored to the way that OCHA manages data. Um, I uh, heard uh, in the introduction by, by Anna, I heard you refer to um, uh, data life cycles and uh, indeed, our uh, guidelines are also structured along um, uh, a data life cycle, uh, as uh, Rick was also showing in the in the work of uh, of Oxfam. And so, I think that's becoming uh, sort of a, a well uh, established practice in data responsibility is to really go step by step in the way we offer guidance on the management of data. The other component of our work is that we provide advice to OCHA staff and our partners on what some of the appropriate mechanisms are for data sharing and data security. So we don't just put out guidance, um, uh, even though Rick, as you said, uh, having written documents really still makes a big difference in uh, uh, this digital era. Um, I think uh, so does uh, human to human interaction and uh, being on call uh, to provide advice when there is, um, let's say, a data incident that takes place or when uh, colleagues run into a challenge regarding the, the management of data. So I think that advisory role that we play both within OCHA and to our partners uh, is really vital to the work that we do. If you can move to the next slide. So the data responsibility guidelines I just mentioned, um, so what we aim to do by the release of the, the guidelines, which, as I said, are in working draft and will likely remain so for the foreseeable future, 
um, is that we aim to provide the principles, practices, and processes for um, the safe, ethical, and effective management of data in humanitarian response. And that means that we don't focus purely on the protection of data, but that we also promote the appropriate sharing of data where that is possible to prevent what we call missed use of data. So think of huge databases accumulating, um, being collected with a lot of effort, but then uh, remaining unused and their potential untapped. So we, so we try to promote protection of data where it's needed and sharing and use of data where it's appropriate. Um, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, like the work um, that Anna is doing and that Rick is doing, our, our work is also uh, structured along this data management process, as we call it, um, leading all the way from planning, so even before the collection or the receiving of data, all the way through to uh, the retention and destruction of data, which is uh, a whole um, field of uh, uh, problems in itself and which we could spend an hour talking about how to appropriately dis destroy data. I remember um, an engine room publication, I think it was saying, uh, titled Shooting Your Hard Drive Into Space, um, which was uh, the outcome of a workshop they'd organized and that was considered one of the only uh, really secure ways of destroying data. So that, that's sometimes uh, what it takes. Can we go to the next slide? So beyond offering uh, just written guidance, we also offer a set of templates that our colleagues can use uh, in their data management practices. And we find this is a helpful way to um, uh, help colleagues think through their particular data management exercise. So this is an example of an information sharing protocol template, or rather the uh, sensitivity classification that's, that's part of it. Uh, and it's just one of one of the templates that we provide uh, to help make it easier for colleagues to um, set up uh, tailored guidance for their data management practices. Next slide, please. So beyond this set of OCHA data responsibility guidelines, we're also putting out a series of guidance notes um, and we're doing that with support from ECHO. Uh, it's a series of eight notes, uh, the first two of which have been released, uh, and actually the very first one relates to something that Rick was mentioning, which is survey data. So we found in our work on HDX, which is a platform where humanitarian organizations can share data, um, we had never allowed any personal data to be shared, but um, we, we had allowed raw survey data. And so at some point a user reached out to us and said, actually, using the right tools, you can re-identify individuals from this raw survey data, even if their names and unique identifiers have been removed. And uh, so we had to look for a tool which, with which we can help prevent that risk of re-identification. And this is um, the, the method that we've started using, statistical disclosure control. And you can read all about it in, uh, in the note. Next slide, please. So the second note relates to something else I mentioned before, which is uh, data incident management. So how to uh, set up the right procedures and protocols for if something goes wrong. And next slide, please. I know I'm running over time a little bit. This is an overview of this, the services that we provide to support the adoption of mainly the guidelines, but data responsibility more uh, widely within OCHA. So it's both introductory briefings, which is sort of the lightest version uh, of the support that we provide, and it goes all the way to uh, doing a complete training or even doing uh, field visits to um, uh, field visits to support data responsibility in uh, our country offices. And two of the visits that we recently did were to Sudan and to Yemen. And in the Yemen context, data responsibility and uh, cash and voucher assistance was one uh, area of work that, uh, that came up quite a bit. Next slide, please. And then I'm almost done. Um, so just quickly on the case studies that we're developing together with the World Economic Forum. Earlier today, we had uh, a call to brief interested researchers and collaborating organizations on the work that we'll be doing. Uh, over the course of next year, we'll be developing uh, three case studies 
um, to really create an evidence base around data responsibility, risk, harm, but also best practice in this space. Um, so that we create an evidence base uh, and have a bit more of a grounded discussion. So a lot of these conversations tend to remain very abstract and theoretical. And through this work, um, we hope to uh, change that. I think here are some of the details and uh, maybe if the slides can be sh shared afterwards, you can read more at your leisure. Um, but that was it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Jos. Wonderful. And yes, we can share the slides um, afterwards with the recording. Um, and I think uh, two takeaways uh, from me just listening to um, your um, talk just now is the uh, co collaboration, collaboration beyond just individual organizations um, that is um, data management overall requires collective action and also food for thought there in uh, acknowledging that you know with the amount of data that we collect uh, there's a real risk of actually not using it um, collecting it just for the sake um, and without further ado now I'm going to hand over to Linda who um, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is um, uh, an independent consultant uh, working in uh, the field of um, ethical uses of technology and digital data. And um, Linda, welcome. I know you missed us at the start, but uh, it's great to have you now. Uh, Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Loud oh, great. Again. Great, great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some um, I guess good practice that um, that I've been developing and just thinking about a lot over the past few years working with different organizations to to kind of start on their responsible data practice journey. Um, so I've, been, I've worked with a number of different organizations of different sizes and that's that's really what I'll bring those kinds of experiences in today. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and I think the first thing is that it's really, really overwhelming um, for most people because most people, you know, working at nonprofits were not hired to be a data responsibility expert. It's, it's kind of a new thing that's come out. Um, and so we can't really expect people to immediately jump into being quite aware of these issues if it's something that's been brought newly into their, into their work. And there's a lot out there. I mean, you have to think about legal issues and ethical issues and compliance issues and data issues and what your donors want and what frontline staff need and want and what's happening with communities and well, communities, what kinds of communities and who in the community and what about your local partners? And it gets to be very, very overwhelming for people. So I think for me, really, the, um, the first thing that that's important for those of us working in this space to try to do is figure out how we can make it accessible and how we can kind of simplify it or at least break it down into manageable parts for different um, people to do um, within the organizations. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so really thinking about one way that that's useful to break it down. So in some of the work that um, I was part of a team that worked on USAID's responsible data considerations. And so we built from the definition that the responsible data forum at the engine room had developed out and, and decided to break it into three really key areas. Um, so we're talking about responsible data use, which means, you know, I think Joe's just mentioned using the data that we collect, um, but then also using data um, responsibly for decision-making. And I think in this piece, it's also making sure that we're, uh, we're dealing with, um, with data quality issues um, and responsibly using data, but making sure that data we are using to make decisions is captured without too much bias um, and that that data is high quality. So that's one area of responsible data for, for me. Um, a second area is around transparency and accountability. Um, donors like to hear a lot about accountability and transparency, but I think really, how are we being transparent and accountable to people whose data we're collecting and using and stewarding? 
Um, and so just making sure that in this whole exercise of being responsible with data overall, we're really putting a face onto what we mean when we say data. So I think of data as an extension of an individual person. So my photo is an extension of me. My bio, you know, biometrics are an extension of me. Um, you know, my health data is an extension of me. So in, in order to treat people with dignity and respect, we need to extend that same treatment to their data and just be very careful with it. Um, and then the last area is around the privacy and security aspect is making sure when we do have data that we're stewarding it, we're keeping it private, we're making sure that, um, that we have the capacity to secure the data that we collect. So I think talking about it in those three, um, you know, three areas can, sometimes can help it make sense for people and it also can help to tap into different people that you have in your organization that are interested in different parts of responsible data. Um, and you can go to the next slide. So for me, really, the first step is, um, is talking with people and understanding what are current attitudes in an organization, what, are, um, what do people already know about this, how are people addressing it already, um, and what are some of the capacity gaps or what are the areas where people don't feel like they know enough or they might feel insecure about their own knowledge. Um, and they might not be doing things not out of bad faith, but just because they just haven't had the training yet. So really understanding and um, where, where the organization is with this. Um, and the second piece is really like finding your people, meaning like if you're a, a responsible data nerd and you really get excited about this stuff, there are probably gonna be other people in your organization that also do. So kind of finding those people and, and seeing how you can tap into them and sort of enlist them on your kind of responsible data crusade. Um, understanding people's motivations, I think going back to the, the earlier um, slide, is some people are going to be financially motivated. They're not going to want a data breach because it costs money to the organization, or they're going to be worried about PR. Um, other people are worried about you know, different parts of this equation. Some people are really, really, really thinking about ethics, and some people, it's not really the primary thing they're thinking about. So one thing we're doing with um, one organization I'm working with is trying to go through different positions in the organization and trying to think about what are the incentives and motivations and develop arguments for those different people. Um, how do you convince your finance people that this is important? How do you convince your CEO this is important? What about your innovation people? What about your frontline staff? And really trying to come up with communication and, and tools and arguments that will resonate with different people to get them involved. Um, and then working on, you know, understanding what do people need to know, um, and then working on those pieces across the organization. You don't have to make everybody into an expert on data, but data is coming into everybody's job description at, at some level. And so thinking about what is the data literacy that different parts of an organization or different people in an organization, what are the core things that they need to know? Um, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> Um, integrating is another thing that we think about a lot. Um, and instead of, again, like, you know, trying to create a whole new parallel track of work, there are probably areas where you can, you can include it, um, include responsible data into what's already happening. So you can think about, you know, should people be getting a responsible data training when they're onboarding, when they're first coming to the organization? Um, how can you insert some of this thinking into existing monitoring and evaluation processes and protocols rather than create something brand new. Um, what do your business development people need to be thinking about when they're looking at, um, at writing proposals and are they promising um, you know, donors or, or corporations or other partners that they can access particular kinds of data that might not be considered you know, good practice. And so how do you incorporate some things into your business development process that require people to ask certain questions and do certain types of due diligence? Um, program leads is quite similar. What do they need to know? What are they doing when they're implementing programs? And are there spaces where you could add some responsible data you know, into that? Um, we're talking with one organization as well about adding some additional angles of responsible data into the risk register, um, which is you know, another way of just making sure that it's continuing being brought up and, and on the table. Um, and then if you're working in an organization that has a lot of work around safeguarding, 
we found also it really resonates with people when you say that it's it's really about digital safeguarding. Um, and so not, again, not having it as something separate, but kind of bringing the safeguarding of people's data into the overall approach to safeguarding. We can go to the next slide. <laughs> um, framing and, and guidance is another area that I think is important. Um, there's so much uh, information out there already. Um, I've written a bunch of things. There's a whole set of tools that, um, that the engine room responsible data forum and I sort of keep up to date. Um, there's something like 18 pages of responsible data resources. And so um, usually think about, you know, these resources need to be not created so much as adapted to a particular organization. Um, so if an organization is a gender organization, it might want to take some of the existing guidance out there, adapt it to, you know, really include a gender focus into the way that you're approaching responsible data. If you're a small organization, you might need something different than a huge, massive, you know, UN organization. So thinking about what are those tools um, that already exist, the guidance principles that exist, and really kind of bring those into the organization um, and adapt them. Um, some organizations are talking about setting indicators or markers to help them understand, you know, where they are now and where they're, where they're trying to get with responsible data and with good data practices. Um, so that's another area that might be useful. We always um, try to start off with principles and values so that it's, it's not seen as a simple compliance exercise, but that it's based on these areas of do no harm and safeguarding. Um, and then I think another area that that we've seen in, in our work is that people are going to want checklists and they're going to want you, they're just going to say, well, what, what do I have to do? Tell me what to do, um, which is really difficult because there's never just one answer. Um, so we're really trying to think about how to get past this idea of people wanting to have checklists and, and helping people to think on their own um, about this, but they need the tools and the skills in order to, to think about these things. Um, so offering coaching and mentoring has been one way that that we've thought about um, so that we're available to teams when they are having to make decisions or when they're writing something or reviewing something so that they can have someone to call on in order to take them through that phase so they start to develop this um, sort of way of thinking this kind of responsible data lens and then can kind of just start to incorporate that in everything they're doing. Um, the next part is really about being careful that you don't, I can go to the next slide, sorry. Making sure that you don't overwhelm people and you know, like accuse people of being irresponsible because people are really busy. We know people are busy, um, but we also know that there are choices that people can make in their day to day. And so how can we kind of break this down in ways that people can make responsible choices with what they're doing about data, but not accuse people of being irresponsible or being bad people if this isn't you know, something that they're used to doing, um, if they're not thinking about responsibility when it comes to data. And so one way um, is really creating space for honest conversations um, and not sort of having an audit mentality or a punish a punitive mentality, but really trying to be open and hear how, what people are dealing with and provide them with tools and, and templates and, you know, in the types of um, support that they need to be able to do their jobs in, in responsible ways when they're involving data. Um, another term that we use a lot is right sizing it. So trying to figure out, as I said earlier, what are the absolute things that I need to know in my job so that I can do my job and I can do my job responsibly without having to, to know everything, you know, about all these, um, all these kind of data aspects. You can go to the next slide. <coughs> um, and the last part is really about thinking holistically. So I think um, both Yoss and, and Rick mentioned using the data life cycle. So I use the data life cycle a lot when I'm thinking about working at the program level or the project level. And then there are some other tools that I use when I'm thinking about the organizational level. So um, at the organizational level, uh, one thing that I've been working on with CARE is a responsible data maturity model that thinks more holistically about the whole approach to responsible data across the whole organization or across one country office. Um, and these are just some of the aspects that when we're thinking more holistically about this process, um, it's around the awareness and the capacity, all the different policies you might need in place. Um, I think the data governance piece is really important. Who is accountable? Um, how does accountability work across everyone? Um, and who, you know, how is that accountability trail happening? Um, 
are people aware when they're developing partnerships with other organizations that data can be a very politically charged piece of that partnership and do they know how to manage that? Um, understanding what data you have at the organization and how is it identified, how do people find it, how is it classified, because if you don't know what data you have, you won't be able to do good data retention and, and data destruction later. Um, what do people know about data privacy rights? How are we managing things like informed consent um, or lawful basis for data collection? And, and there should be an organizational awareness of that. Um, and what are the different legal frameworks in all the different countries where, where you're working? Um, the next slide. <clears throat> Sorry, you can go, yeah. Um, how are, are we conducting risk assessments and understanding what are some of the ways to mitigate risks? Um, and then these other pieces, um, you know, minimization of data, data security, how do we share data? Do we have templates and agreements and legal frameworks in place for data sharing? Um, are we thinking about mosaic effect and what might happen if we do, you know, start to combine data? Um, and then is there some sort of protocol in place if an organization should happen to have a, an incident or a data breach? Um, so those are the areas that are in, you can go to the next slide, that are in the maturity model. And it's really, um, it's a document that tries to help organizations just decide where they are currently in this kind of journey to becoming more responsible with how they manage data and where they would like to be in the future. And, and we'll use that to have organizations kind of go through the, the document and circle where they are now and then make some plans towards getting to where they want to be that turn into very concrete actions that are um, the responsibility of different parts of the team or parts of the organization. And so hopefully um, you can go to the next slide if you, you know, can, can kind of look at it in a way that's broken down, that's, that's more simple, where the responsibilities are shared across, where you have some resources. Um, instead of being this crazy overwhelming thing, it can be a very lovely, peaceful, um, you know, calm, calm body of water that, that doesn't freak you out anymore. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Linda. Um, thank you for this. Um, yeah, it's, uh, again, uh, so um, important, uh, isn't it, in um, uh, mapping uh, data management practices is actually um, understanding what motivates people that you're working with and um, how you can, uh, as a practitioner, uh, or as you said, as a data nerd, how can you integrate into existing processes and you know, really focus on the positive reinforcement um, and the right sizing. But uh, um, I'm going to leave uh, leave us on this beautiful slide, and uh, uh, we we don't have as much time for the questions as uh, we'd um, hoped originally. But uh, just to repeat that, please feel free to uh, post your questions in the chat box. And in the meantime, to kick us off. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Rick, based on uh, your experience, uh, what, uh, what do you think are some of the quick wins uh, for organizations um, when it comes to this, uh, the big question of policy into practice? Um, yeah, so I guess uh, a couple of them echoing some of the things Linda mentioned. Um, so one is building it into those kind of induction processes. So as people come on board into the organization, um, we certainly find kind of staff turnover is a big issue in programs. So as much as we go and do these trainings, um, it, it's far better to just build it into the everyday processes whenever, when anyone starts. Um, and I think the other thing is, is getting the thought processes in early in that life cycle. So really getting people to think about say the risk analysis side and understanding the context in uh, linked with what they would normally do. So if you were to be doing a cash distribution, you know, physical cash, hopefully it's more in the thought process to do a risk analysis, you know, risk for our staff, risk for people we're handing the cash over to, partners, just because we're moving to um, let's say mobile money or e-vouchers doesn't mean there aren't risks they are just different but hopefully it's getting people to think in that way they would be doing risk analysis for this work if it was you know a more traditional um, intervention you know we need to do that as well in these kind of newer ways of working
Thanks, Rick. Um, 100% agree. Um, we have a big thank you to the presenters from Abdullahi, uh, which I 100% echo. Um, and also question, can we say when we talk about sensitive data that it is actually part of uh, protection intervention and protection data? Who would like to respond to that? Perhaps Linda. Yeah, I think I think definitely when I'm most of the the things that I'm talking about when I think about responsible data are are any data that would be considered either personal data or sensitive data, um, and sensitive data is going to change according to context and according to who you're talking to. Um, but yeah, definitely I would say that it's part of the data that we need to be careful um, about protecting. Uh, thanks, Linda. Um, any reaction to this, Yos, uh, from you? Um... Yeah, I just quickly add uh, to Linda's answer that uh, sensitive data is definitely part of protection data, right? So some protection data will be considered sensitive, but then there might also be other sensitive data that's not traditionally considered protection data uh, in the humanitarian domain. So there I'm thinking of, for example, the locations of medical facilities, which in some humanitarian response contexts might be uh, vulnerable to targeting. Um, uh, and then in other contexts might be completely okay to share. And so there we come to the contextuality of, of risk and sensitivity, which uh, Linda was just referring to. So, I mean, a really short and maybe not so helpful answer is, Yes, and uh, sometimes no. <laughs> okay, um, I think still helpful though. Um, and um, yes, what, what, what do you think, um, what do you see as the top risks uh, actually, um, sticking with the theme of um, CVA and risk, what do you see as the top risk when it comes to uh, responsible data management that humanitarian organizations face? That's a that's an interesting question. I mean, there's lots of uh, risks to um, to look at, as I think is becoming clear from this call uh, again. Um, and and maybe I'm not answering your question in, in the way that you would um, that you would uh, think. But um, maybe the one of the greatest risks is a false sense of security that can be created by having a really good policy in writing. So. Um, some organizations have adopted data policies, data protection policies, privacy policies, which look comprehensive and look very strong. And this might give off the perception that those organizations sort of have it covered, have it down. Um, and what we find is that that's often not the case, right? So even though you might have the best policy out there and on paper everything looks good, that doesn't say... Um, that doesn't say it all when it comes to behavior. Right? So the way that staff get trained or get, um, um, get onboarded, as uh, Linda was mentioning, all of these um, sort of non-formalized ways of creating data responsibility are an essential part of, um, of becoming responsible in data management in this, uh, in this field. So I think that would be the greatest risk, sort of this, this too strong of a focus on what's in writing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've heard from um, uh, quite a few um, colleagues now that uh, many see this area for the sector as the uh, pretty much the uh, potential next Me Too moment. So I think that's a, a stark warning from you there, not to not to be. Um, lulled by this uh, false sense of security with the policies in place. Um, and um, I, um, just looking at the chat box and the time, I think we have time for um, perhaps one more question that um, I was um, I'm curious, Linda, uh, to, you know, because you've done some quite a lot of work in this um, space over the years and uh, we've talked about um, how you've observed the just the level of awareness change 
uh, but um, in your work with the donors in particular, because I think um, this is a, a key stakeholder group for um, cash and voucher um, assistance space. So how, how do you see um, donor position in relation to um, responsible data practices um, of their implementing partners change over time? Mm. And I think right now I feel like it's it's slightly inconsistent um, because I feel like on the one hand organizations are being asked to really push towards um, a lot of these more innovative practices and, and sort of massive amounts of data collection because there's a huge focus on accountability coming from donors, um, meaning accountability through something like biometrics all the way down to you know, did this individual get two sacks of rice or not? Um, which, which I think is, is problematic because at the same time, they're starting to become aware of the importance of, of having some of these policies and, and some of these different protections in place. And so I feel like it's a little, um, you know, kind of on two extremes where donors are interested in asking about responsible data policies and pushing for responsible data practices, but at the same time demanding massive amounts of data be collected that could potentially put people at risk. So, so I think there needs to be a little more awareness building um, amongst a lot of donors about, about these issues, not so much in talking about them, because I think a lot of donors are talking about them and thinking about them with one hand, but um, with the other hand are kind of contributing to to the risks that that you know that vulnerable people face by asking for so much data and such vulner such um, granular data. Uh, absolutely, um, and it's um, you know um, we, we're um, definitely um, hearing that um, uh, feedback from uh, many of our members is that disconnect between the. Um, uh, on the side of the donors, uh, but I guess you know who who face their own um, compliance um, pressures uh, that then pushes the demand. So definitely um, an area where more dialogue is needed and perhaps um, more unpacking of the you know what what this demands for more data, what actual harms they could cause um, on the ground for vulnerable groups, as you say, and um, we're. Um, out of time uh, with one minute to go. I just wanted to thank uh, every uh, speaker today for your time and for your um, excellent presentations, uh, which as I said, we are recording and will be posting. Um, I think uh, the time uh, set for this webinar was probably against us as I know that it's uh, late in the day for some colleagues in Europe and in other regions. So um, the recording would quite come in handy. And I also wanted to highlight that uh, Kaup will be diving um, deeper into this topic uh, at the upcoming Cash Week and um, continuing the conversation with uh, Linda, Jos, uh, and Rick, and a few others on the um, who will be um, at the opening panel of the cash and risk uh, on the third day of the cash week uh, and that panel will be live streamed so tune in and have a listen but thank you for joining and um, thank you again to our panelists i'm gonna close the call now and um, have a wonderful um, rest of the day wherever you are thank you so much for having us Thank you. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Thank you. Bye.